guys, what's up? Jack here. Um, hope you guys are all doing good out there. So I get so many questions about um, sweet picking from a lot of students and a lot of people, you know, emailing me, asking me questions about it, how I approach it, how I learn it, how did I develop it. Well, so I just wanted, I thought it'd be a little bit quicker if I just, uh, you know, film a, film a video for you guys so you can check this out and uh, really sort of take a look in sort of the way that I think about sweet picking and arpeggios and chords in general. The two ways I developed it, the first way um, was kind of the, the metronome workout that I'm sure a lot of you have heard, out, heard about, a lot of you have tried. Um, so this definitely helped me develop um, all of my techniques a lot. When I noticed I started to get a lot better was when I actually started to play over backing tracks. So, and the reason for it is because over backing tracks you can really hear how the uh, arpeggio sounds over the, the backing chords and you can kind of really learn how to use your arpeggios in a musical context. So it, there's nothing worse than being stuck in a stuck in a box or stuck in one shape and not really being able, able to apply it in a solo or improvisation setting. So that's why I really recommend the backing track thing. Um, so the way I really think about technique and, uh, you know, especially sweet picking is I, I really see it as a, kind of a musical trick. So if we imagine that a, um, a magician, you know, flick and flick a card out of his sleeve, you know, he's done that movement so many times um, to where he's really mastered it and he's really quick at it. Um, the same thing, anyone that skateboarded or, you know, BMX and you learn how to ollie a skateboard or jump a BMX, it's just, it's that muscle memory that you, that at first it seems really difficult. And once you've, you know, practiced so many times, you, uh, you, you can kind of, well, hopefully do it on the fly eventually. You want to get it to a point where your hands remember it so your head doesn't have to, your brain doesn't have to because it's too, it, you want to get up to the speed to where your brain doesn't have to think about it anymore. Um, your hands can just do it. So that's the goal. So I really recommend practicing this stuff really slowly and the reason why I do is because you want your brain to really take in the information and if you start trying to do this stuff really quickly when you're not quite ready um, you're going to be doing yourself a little bit of a disservice. So, and this goes with any technique, not just sweet picking. Um, I really think that the speed happens naturally. The speed will show up by itself after you've really run these, you know, up shapes or whatever they may be to at a certain low speed for a certain amount of time. So don't worry about going really fast right off the bat. So the way that I think about arpeggios and sweet picking is I really look for my root note when I'm playing these. Um, so for example, if I learn like a, a, let's just say an A minor triad shape, and I really recommend starting with your triads as well, you know, getting your triad arpeggios down, being able to play them in every key. And then after that, you can start to jump into, you know, seventh arpeggios and ninths and, and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, really get those triads down. And uh, they're not only good for sweet picking, but they're really cool to solo with because when you land, you know, land a musical phrase on the, the root third or fifth of a, you know, a chord tone um, that it really sounds like you're really finishing your sentence, your musical sentence, your musical phrase. Let's just say I learned an A minor arpeggio shape. Say I learned the, the three string one here. It's not really going to be helpful if I if I only know the one shape and I'm stuck there the whole time. So so I really recommend finding your note names on the neck um, and really using these as kind of uh, pinpoints to, to sort of connect these arpeggios together. So for example. I might look here and find that there's an A here. So that might be a root, so I can go. There's a, oh, off of that same root, I can do another shape here. Uh, there's an A right here. Uh, we've got another one. Uh, well, so, so right there, I just did three shapes. So let's call this shape one, shape two. In shape three, right, and then um, obviously the fretboard repeats itself, so I have an A here, so I can do this, this shape one again up here. Right, so this allows me to sort of connect all these shapes together across the neck. And I really re recommend sticking on a backing track, for in this case, A minor. Right, and connecting them that way, and get really getting really used to connecting them. Obviously, for those of you that know, um, there's a relative major for every minor 
key that we're in and vice versa there's going to be a relative minor for every uh, major shape that we play so what I would recommend doing is run in your um, your so pick a key run your minor arpeggios get really good at them and then find your relative major so in this case um, we just played a minor so then I might jump to C major and then play through my C major arpeggios so my first C that I could find no, there's one right here. Uh, I have another one right here. Have another one right here. And then back to the first shape that I did again. Up here. So th this is cool because you can kind of connect your minor shapes and then your major shapes together to, to make really long, long flowing patterns. So once you get down your major shapes, um, your minor shapes I'd, I'd recommend sort of playing through the harmonized major scale but in a uh, in sweet sweet pick form so let's just say we take a C major scale so I played the C major scale across just the A string and then uh, what's cool to practice is, is going across this major scale bit and I try it arpeggio form so it's gonna go C major D minor E minor, F major, G major, oh, A minor, B diminished, and then C major again. Right, and uh, this is going to help you connect, sort of make your own arpeggio patterns as well, and it's going to sort of help you follow a chord progression if you want to do your triad arpeggios over a particular chord progression. If I start here, C major, D minor. B minor, uh, F major, G major, A minor, B diminished, C major again. It might sound like I'm playing a lot of notes, but in actuality, uh, for each one of those arpeggio shapes, I'm only actually playing three notes per chord. So for example, C major, C, E, G, and it just repeats. C, E, G, right? So, okay, then we've got our C up here. I just, that right there is just three notes. As far as um, the actual technique of it goes, um, the way I developed the technique to the metronome was I would, let's just say I set my metronome at 100 BPM and then I would play whatever arpeggio shape I was working on. I would play it 10 times to make sure it was really in time. Time is very important as well. Time in, uh, don't overlook timing. Um, even if the, uh, the, the sweep arpeggio isn't particularly clean, um, what will make it sound cool is the fact if, if it's really in time. So really, really focus on the timing. Um, so, make, so do 10 reps, make sure it's really in time um, and it's as clean as it can be. Then um, what I did after the 10 reps was I would speed speed up my, my uh, metronome just 1 BPM. So it's barely anything, really, really, really slow increase in, in speed. And then do another 10 reps and then keep going that way. And it's, it's pretty tedious. It's not the most fun thing to do, but it really, really helped me develop my technique. So there's, there's a sort of more mechanical way um, that I developed it. And the more musical way I developed it was once I had the actual technique down and I was kind of used to... Um, you know, really used to playing these shapes were, was I would take, you know, take the shapes and pick a different key and just jam over backing tracks on YouTube and just really play them slowly. And I would use them in my improvisation. So now if I, you know, I could be soloing, you know, in the E minor blues, but um, after I'm done with my blues licks, I know that I can, you know, whip out a, an arpeggio as well if I want to, which is, uh, which is which are, which are really fun to solo with. Also, when we have a tricky part of the arpeggio, let's just say let's just say if we've just learned an A minor arpeggio shape. So right here, I'm going to go 12, 15. I'm going to hammer that on. And I'm going to pick down, down, 14, 14. Then 13 on the B string. 12 on the high E. Going to hammer on to 17. Pull off, back up, 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 pull off. Let's say I've just learned that shape um, and I want to get it really clean. So that, so it, you might find it quite easy to go and on the top. You might find that quite easy to pull off, um, but it's, it gets tricky in the middle. So right here. 
So what I recommend is what doing what I call dissecting the arpeggio. So what I mean by that is you take the, the trickiest part of the arpeggio, the part that's really giving you the most trouble, just really take a magnifying glass and zoom in on that area and just really, 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 um, you know, drill that to a metronome or back and track and just really, really take care of that tricky part. Uh, it's, it's all about making your, your weak points your strong points. Um, so, so you might be really clean here, really clean here, but in the middle it might, you might have trouble getting that clean. So what we do is we, we kind of zoom in here and what, what I recommend doing is maybe taking two notes at a time or three notes at a time and just sort of going down, down, up, up. See I'm doing the roll right here. Down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up. Then maybe three strings. Down, 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 up, 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 down, 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 up. Add in the. You get a nice. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about the, the the palm muting. Now, what you might notice if I play this slowly is that um, both of my hands are working in tandem. So um, they're kind of working as a team. So th again, let's take that A minor shape. Um, for with my right hand, as I go down, uh, for the unwanted strings, for the high strings, my uh, my first finger is actually um, I'm using this area of my finger to actually bar the high, sorry, uh, mute the high strings so that they don't ring out and we don't have any unnecessary string noise. Um, so as we go down, this is this this finger is barring, and then as as I as we come down to the high end of the arpeggio, my right hand will come into play and start blocking off the low strings. So here, so as we go down the arpeggio, this finger is kind of muting the high strings, um, and as we get to the top, this hand comes into play, mutes comes back up, this hand's muting, this hand takes over. Um, this has never some, been something that I've really consciously thought about until I started to really teach this stuff, um, but hopefully you'll find it helpful. So really slowly, if you watch my technique, the left hand's in control of as far as muting goes. Now you'll see the right hand is really muting those low strings. Oh, left hand mutes, then the right hand mutes. So slowly. working as a team. So hopefully that will clean up your arpeggios. You run through your cycle of fourth, start in C major, play, play all your C major arpeggio triads over the over the neck, then jump to F, do all your F major ones, B flat, E flat, A flat, so, and so on. Run through your cycle of fourth with them, that's, that's a really helpful tool. It'll help you play these arpeggios in every key. It's really, really important to have a fretboard roadmap. And uh, what I mean by that is to be able to know where you're on the fretboard at all times and know your note names. If you guys haven't heard of a guitar player called Daryl Gable, go and check him out. He's got some really, really good informative um, stuff for finding note names on the neck. But just really look into finding your note names on the neck. And I, I don't mean sort of figuring it out like uh, E, if this is E, then uh, F, F sharp. No, you, you need to be really, really quick because you want to be able to, you know, pull out these arpeggios on the fly. And this won't help just your... your your arpeggio playing. This is going to help you, you, you know, all of your playing. Get a good fretboard roadmap, and by that I mean really be able to not just recognize the shapes, but recognize the note names on the neck really quickly. So just remember that your arpeggios are just chords. If you can understand chords and understand chord theory, then you understand the arpeggio, and then then after that is just the technique that you got to get down, and then there's really nothing stopping you after that. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope this has been really helpful, and please subscribe and thank you guys so much.